All right, well, uh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be on the program. This is joint work with Leonid Dimitris and Brian Seigmiller. Uh, and the kind of our starting point in writing this paper is thinking about some kind of macro trends that a lot of, a lot of folks are talking about, right? We know that, uh, the, for example, the labor share of output has declined substantially. There's been a big increase in income inequality, rise in the skill premium. These sort of macro facts, many of the stories that people have in mind for these have something to do with technology, broadly speaking. And um, our objective in this paper is a very concrete one, which is to say, kind of how does technology affect workers? And we're going to try to contribute to this literature, which obviously many, many people have thought about, with uh, kind of a, a very large measurement contribution. So we're going to try to be much more specific relative to what the literature has done so far. So you can think about like David, many of David Otter's papers that emphasize measures of routineness or things like that. We know something bad happened to routine workers over the last 30 years. It's kind of very high level. And so we're going to try to leverage some new data uh, to construct a measure of labor saving technology exposure. I'll, I'll explain a little bit later why I think that this is more likely to capture labor saving technologies rather than other forms of technologies that affect workers. And then we're going to kind of, so if you'd like, we're going to have a series, which will say at the occupation level or even at the occupation and industry level, to what extent is a given worker exposed to arrivals of new technologies? And then we're going to take this measure and link it up with worker level data, both kind of repeated cross sections where we can actually go way, way back in time, all the way to the 1850s, um, and look at how these arrivals of new technologies affect workers. And then I'll also have some new data, which will be kind of for the more recent period, the last 40 years or so, where I'm going to be able to follow individual workers over time and see how they're affected. What are we going to find? We're going to discover that kind of the types of occupations that appear to be exposed to technologies has shifted to some extent um, over time. So I'll show you a couple trends there. And in general, when new technologies arrive, this tends not to be good news uh, from the perspective of workers. Okay, and so we're we're finding a lot of evidence which is going to be very consistent with a displacement type channel. Interestingly enough, we're also going to find that the highest paid workers actually are most exposed to these, these new technologies in the sense that they experience the largest declines in earnings and big increases in earnings risk. The same is going to be true for um, older workers as well. So just to kind of motivate what we're going to do here, this is a very simple example. So two different types of occupations that involve very similar tasks. So order clerks, these are folks who might have worked in a call center and they would take orders over the phone um, from catalogs and things like that. And then there's also library clerks or personnel clerks. You know, people are also kind of doing kind of routine data processing type tasks. They involve probably a fairly similar set of people, similar set of skills. And then something happened in the 90s. You know, we had the, the huge explosion of e-commerce. What we're going to do is build a measure at the occupation level, which is kind of at what rate are new technologies arriving that look close to order clerks? You know, these folks who might be displaced by Amazon.com and all these kinds of things versus these library and personnel clerks. And what we're going to see is basically that, oh, that's cool. Um, there's a big spike in technology kind of right as we're getting into the, going through the IT revolution, and that's accompanied by a very large decline in the relative wages between the two groups. Okay? So how are we going to kind of approach this? So our, our broad idea for measurement is going to partially build on uh, some of Dimitris' earlier work, where we're going to kind of, if you, if you take an analogy to what we do as academics, we write papers, and a very good thing for us to do if we kind of a measure of success would be, imagine we coin a new term like secular stagnation or equity premium puzzle. Suddenly a new set of papers comes out that uses our term a lot, and no one had used this term before. That's going to be the kind of core idea for how we're going to try to identify patents that look very important. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna use this measure of breakthrough technologies, which is is just capturing that sort of idea. And the the key advantage of this type of a measure is we really only need text data in order to do this. So unlike measures of say citations, where the data kind of starts recently, this allows us go all to, to go all the way back to the very first patents. So we can show you some trends. Um, in relationship between new technologies and workers, even going back to the 1800s. Okay, so my measure here is just going to be whether a patent shows up in the top decile of the distribution of this measure of kind of impact of a paper. 
Okay, so this is from, from their earlier papers, so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. But the point here is you see kind of the types of patents that, or the types of areas where we're, we're seeing these breakthroughs has moved around a little bit over time. So there's sort of the second industrial revolution. You can see big spikes in th things like furniture, textiles, and apparel. And more recently, uh, the big spikes have been in computers, electronics, medical equipment, and so on. Okay, so you can see, again, there's this measure, sort of where we're, we're seeing huge movements in the frontier, has changed over time. Okay, so just to kind of motivate what we're going to do next, before I start talking about workers, what I want to show you is that some of these patterns that we've seen in the aggregate and talked a lot about in the aggregate actually show up in the cross section as well. So if you, these are kind of Georgia style local projections where we're going to look at how output and employment, and we have some other uh, outcomes in the paper, um, how they respond when new technologies, new breakthrough technologies emerge at the industry level. Okay, and just like what we see in the aggregate, output per worker has risen, but the kind of labor market effects look more muted. Employment is either flat or modestly declining following the arrival of, of breakthrough technologies. And we also show in the paper that the labor share of output at the industry level also declines substantially when these new technologies emerge. Okay. So this is kind of consistent with the idea that one role of these new technologies is to, say, automate specific tasks, eliminate the demand for some workers, so we become more productive, but this isn't necessarily helping the affected workers. So what does it mean to be exposed to a new technology? Our idea here is going to be to use textual analysis so we can, again, construct measures of exposure that are going to go all the way back in time. So we're basically going to read the patents and then read measures of occupation task descriptions that we can get from sources like ONET. We're actually going to use the Dictionary of Occupation Titles, which is a little bit older source of task descriptions of auction, uh, these occupations. And we're going to get a measure, which is a distance metric between a patent, so each of the millions of patents we see, and an individual occupation. OK? And then I'm going to measure at the worker level, or, or sorry, at the occupation level, a measure of technology exposure. So the idea is going to be, I'm going to sum up these distance metrics for patents that look like they were valuable. So if there's a patent that, that you get, it looks like it wasn't a breakthrough, that's going to be discarded. But the idea is these, those order clerks are going to be affected by a bunch of these patents filed by folks like Amazon.com that are extremely influential. Okay, and so we're going to have this measure of basically per capita, the number of breakthrough technologies that look close to what you do. Okay, and just to kind of Pause for a second. Because of the way this is working, we're, we're going to be looking at kind of words in the patents that look close to the words describing what people do in their jobs. This is probably going to tend to pick up labor saving type technologies. Okay? It doesn't have to be, but you can imagine that if you kind of have a machine that is doing a bunch of things, you're describing how the machine operates, it sounds like what factory workers do, that's probably going to capture this sort of automation type exposure. And one way we can see that more formally is we can construct, we can do a data mining type exercise where we uh, use principal components type technologies for text to identify terms that look like they predict whether um, a patent is labor saving or labor augmenting. And what you see is that if you kind of try to find a massively displacive factor, that's going to be really correlated to just the average of these things. So I'll just show you things that just average over all these technologies but we're going to tend to pick up labor-saving technologies. OK, so what do we see? Well, what's interesting is that if you look at the type of occupations that are exposed to new technologies, that has shifted over time. Okay, And what you see is basically, at the beginning of our sample, this red line here is the set of manual occupations that are in the top quintile of the manual physical distribution. So think factory workers, farmers, you know, things like that. You see that like 80, not quite 80%, but three quarters of the or patents that are showing up in the first kind of two thirds of our sample are very close to these physical tech, uh, tasks. As we go later into the sample, however, you're going to see other categories picking up. So routine cognitive, think of all the occupations that have been affected by software and things like that. And even uh, manual interpersonal and non-routine cognitive tasks in recent years have seen a big increase in the number of uh, patents that are related. Likewise, I think folks in this room would have been very safe back in the 1800s. These days, uh, it does look a little different in the sense that um, 
occupations that have higher shares of educated workers also look like they're more exposed. Okay? One other thing that we see is that, kind of consistent with the literature on the hollowing out of the skill distribution, it looks like that middle skill occupations do, on average, tend to be more exposed to these, these patterns. So if I sort occupations based on the average wages of workers in that occupation, if you're kind of in the middle of the skill distribution, you're going to tend to have kind of a, a half standard deviation higher exposure on average. Okay, so first result I'll show you is, is over a very long period of time, uh, per, th this is a regression where I'm going to look at the log change and the share of workers that are in a given occupation. And these are in units of growth rates per year. And all the, the regressions I'm going to show you are in standard deviation units. So the interpretation of a coefficient of 0.48 is that over the next 10 years, a one standard deviation change, sorry, that covers the coefficient, uh, one standard deviation change in our innovation exposure is associated with 48 basis points per year um, decline in occupational employment. So it's a very large effect. And we can, if you're concerned that maybe this just picks up, say, declining industries or things like that, we can also do a measure of this where we include industry and time fixed effects. So industry cross time, and we can see that actually the coefficients, if anything, get larger once we do that. Okay, so these magnitudes are quite large. Again, this is per year, so this, this last coefficient of over the next 20 years, a one standard deviation change is associated with almost a 20% decline in occupational employment. Okay? Just to show you that, you know, in a sense, this, this force has always been with us, we can run this regression year by year. So this is using decennial data that we get every 10 years. And what you see is that these coefficients are kind of persistently negative throughout the sample period. Okay? So we can look at employment growth. We see, I already showed you using these decennial censuses that employment declines. You can do the same thing with wages. And what we see as well is that wage, wages tend to decline substantially following the emergence of new technologies. And again, these, these magnitudes are fairly large, right? So a uh, 20 basis point per year decline in wages um, over the next 10 years is still a 2% change in response to one standard deviation shock. The other thing I'll note is you might think that maybe what this does is that innovation is directed towards, say, overpaid occupations, and those would have, say, experienced mean reversion anyway, so you'd expect to see wages decline. That's kind of inconsistent, though, with what we see happening with the quantities. It's just that you know, labor is scarce, and so eventually the, the supply will pick up. You'd expect prices and quantities to move in opposite directions, but the fact that they move in the same direction is very consistent with a decline in labor demand. The other thing you might be worried about is just that this is purely a composition effect. You can imagine a completely benign scenario where, where say, high-income workers uh, move out of certain occupations into others. They don't even experience any sort of change in their outcomes. It's purely a measurement thing, right? They, they go and they do something else. So our paper is actually going to be one of the first to be able to do this with individual panel microdata. So we have a set of social security earnings records that we can link to people we see in the current population survey. And then we can look within workers, so holding the set of workers for, fixed, I measure your occupation, then I'm gonna hit you with an innovation shock, and then I'm gonna look at what happens to your earnings going forward. Okay, so these are within person growth rates. So we can see things not just about expected outcomes, but also about risk at the individual. Okay, I'm also gonna, when I construct my measure of innovation, I'm going to be able to use the granularity of, of my data to be a little bit more precise here. So I'm actually going to construct a measure of exposure at the occupation and industry level. So I know the, origin, the industries of origin of these patents, and so then I can actually do something like comparing two workers who are in the same occupation at the same time. One is in an industry that's developed a bunch of new breakthrough technologies that look close to this occupation, and the other one is not. Mechanically, the way we're going to implement that is by having both occupation year and industry year fixed effects in what we do. Okay? So, what do we find? At the individual worker level, again, following people over time, we see that uh, one standard deviation change in innovation exposure is associated with a fairly large and persistent decline in workers' earnings over the next three, five, or ten years. Okay? So, these sort of composition type stories. Uh, we're not finding evidence that that's driving things, and honestly, this literature is mostly used repeated cross-section data, so this is one of the first papers that's actually able to, to say, no, it's not just this composition effect. 
Okay? You can also then sort on various worker characteristics and think, think about who's exposed. What we're seeing is that the magnitudes are considerably larger for older workers. Um, and we're going to find as well that they're considerably larger for high, um, more highly paid workers, which is perhaps a surprising result. Right? A lot of the stories we have about automation, routine bias technology change, you would tend to think that it's kind of low-skilled jobs that get automated away. High-skilled workers actually benefit um, because they become more productive. We're actually going to find that these earnings losses are largest in the top 5% of the uh, income distribution. Okay. So that, that last fact seems kind of surprising. Um, it, if, imagine kind of many of the stories that we've talked about for the rise in the skill premium and income inequality involve capital skill complementary. Right? The idea is that new technologies tend to make high-skilled workers more productive, and they substitute for low-skilled workers. This pulls workers apart. Okay, And so then, in that, that view of the world, you tend to think that if skill is commensurate with wages, these highly paid workers should see a big increase in their, their labor earnings. We're going to find the opposite. Well, kind of, we actually are going to make the case that this is very consistent with capital skill complementarity, but we're missing one important piece, which is that while skilled workers as a group may benefit, the specific membership in the group of skilled workers can change over time. So some workers may be left behind if their skills are vintage specific. And so if that was the case, you might also expect that this is kind of a messy process. It's not that all workers experience a 1% decline, but it might be an average of very large declines for some workers and kind of benign effects for others. So we can actually test that in the, in the microdata. So what I'm doing here is constructing a measure of kind of experiencing an idiosyncratic disaster. So having a very large earnings decline over the next five years that puts you in the bottom decile of the distribution of income growth rates. And what we see is that this measure of tail risk also goes up considerably following a bunch of new breakthroughs that are close to a worker. And that these risk increases are actually the largest for these high skilled workers and older workers. OK, uh, we find modest differences on education, but let me keep going in the interest of time. So just to kind of help us think through the, these effects that we find, what we do next is we take a sort of off-the-shelf model of capital skill complementarity, and we're going to just add one very simple feature, which is a displacement channel. Okay? So in this model, output is just a CES aggregate of high-skilled tap labor, and then a bundle of technology C and low-skilled labor L. And we're going to have the usual uh, <laughs> science on the parameters, so we're going to assume that skilled labor is going to be more complementary to, to technology than unskilled labor. In other words, it's easier to substitute low-skilled tasks with technology than high-skilled tasks. Um, and then we're going to have a, the, the technology is going to follow an AR1, kind of continuous time AR1, with occasional upward jumps. So most of the time, there's kind of depreciation of technology. But every once in a while, this Poisson shock DN turns on, and technology is going to jump upwards. Here's the thing that's going to be slightly new about our model relative to, to previous work. We're going to assume that the way that workers are compensated is that they have some amount of skill theta, and then their wage is going to be kind of like a, a theta weighted average of skill, skilled, um, sorry, the high skilled wage and the low skilled wage. And so this theta is going to evolve from two mechanisms. There's going to be kind of idiosyncratic learning. So every once in a while, uh, theta is going to go up by m percent. And then there's also going to be a displacement force. So there's this dnit, which is going to be constructed this way. Notice that dn is the product of the aggregate shock, which is whether technology jumps upwards, and, sorry, and dit, which is a dummy, which is one if you end up being exposed to the new technology. OK? So the idea is going to be that when new vintages of technology arrive, some workers are going to experience a de decline in skill demand. Right? It's, you had some expertise in the old vintage of technology. No, it's no longer relevant. OK, so this is just to kind of show you roughly how the model works. But it is also going to reproduce those kinds of aggregate facts that I showed you. When new technology arrives, um, we're going to see the output is going to go up. The labor share is going to go down. But what's also interesting in this model is that the quantity of skill is actually going to change. You're going to have more low-skilled labor because some of the formerly high-skilled workers have now seen their expertise displaced, and they're competing with these low-skilled workers. This is going to push up the skill premium more than would normally be the case. It's also going to have this force that generates 
uh, inequality effects and response to these new changes in technology. Why? Because if you're a worker who is not displaced, you're strictly better off, right? We have more technology that's complementary to your skill, and your labor has now become more scarce because a bunch of low-skilled workers have now, um, a bunch of the people you're formerly competing with are now have become low-skilled workers. Okay, so workers who aren't exposed and are highly skilled are much better off following the new technologies, but workers who are high income and exposed actually have much further to fall when, uh, when new technologies arrive. Okay, this is, we can do some counterfactuals from the model, and what you'll see is that this will kind of match these aggregate trends. So if the rate of change of technology goes up, uh, the labor share is going to go down, output's going to go up, and income inequality is going to go up substantially. Okay, so the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll shut up, is that this is kind of gives us a slightly more nuanced interpretation of the Golden and Katz view of, of some of these aggregate facts. And that model, basically, technology moves around. The, the quantity of skill is kind of fixed. It's like stamped on your forehead when you enter the labor market. And so education is kind of slowly moving around uh, the quantity of skill, but that's, that's kind of a very low frequency pattern. Here, our point is that technology can move both the price of skill, but also the quantity of skill of skill, and that can kind of exacerbate these patterns of income inequality that we see. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to your discussion. Thank you very much. The discussion is Michael Peter. Thanks for the organizers giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. Thanks for the authors um, for writing it. I learned a lot from reading this in detail. So, you know, as, uh, as Larry said, so this is, uh, I think, a paper which gives really a, a new spin on a substantial question. It's like a very old question in, you know, in growth economics, innovation economics. What's the factor bias of technological progress? What's the factor bias between capital and labor, between skilled and unskilled? And, and so far, you know, that literature is, is broad, obviously, but it has focused very much on sort of the later part of the 20th century, which we had more data for. So before reading this paper last week, sort of my prior on this question uh, was very much influenced by sort of the standard kind of balanced growth path aspects of the US economy. So this was oops, sort of my view of the world. You know, it's a 2% growth rate, looks very much balanced. When you look at the labor share, it's pretty much you know, constant until maybe the 1970s, 1980s, and see, then we see a little bit of a decline. And so my prior on this path of technological progress in the US um, was basically thinking about, well, until sort of the Second World War, maybe a little before, it kind of looks like a factor neutral type, solo type technology. And then in the last 50 years, maybe we see a combination of a capital bias growth together with some skill complementarity, which would explain the fall in labor share, the rise in the skill premium, et cetera. That's at least what I teach my undergraduates just two weeks ago. Well, that was before reading this paper. So I think what this paper puts to the forefront is to say, no, like maybe the 20th century and the late 19th century look very different. And in particular, maybe technological progress was really labor replacing for a long time. And so I think this is a kind of a big deal result for our understanding of the growth process. And I think it gets to the heart of thinking about this distinction between is there sort of a, a difference between like tractors in 1880 and robots in 1980? I think many of us think like somehow tractors didn't seem to be, you know, kind of hurting labor a lot. But I think what this paper says, like maybe yes, right? Maybe these technologies in 1850, 1860 were already labor -related. So as Larry said, uh, I think the main contribution of this paper is, uh, is really sort of the empirical kind of measurement exercise and documenting these trends in a variety of data sources and in a variety of, uh, of, of um, uh, over a variety of years. So I'm not going to have time, obviously, to go through all the details. This is just give you an overview of what this paper does. So on the time dimension, it looks from 1850 to 2020, uses census data to have a 150 period uh, overview on occupational employment growth. This is what we've seen with Larry that they have you know, the, the 1980 ones on occupational employment growth, occupational wage growth from the CPS, they have the individual level data from the panel. 
have the sectoral productivity growth data from the NBR manufacturing database. And, and all these results, even though they're kind of sometimes a different quantitatively, and I'll point out some quantitative differences, sort of qualitatively, they seem to draw, seem to point to a relatively common story that you know, labor is a little bit on the short end of technological progress, and it doesn't matter when you look at the quantities, at the prices, at the labor share. So this is what I'm going to do in my, oh, then there's also, uh, you know, we've seen this in the, in the talk, there's also some heterogeneity by age, routine, etc. So in my discussion today, I want to do three things. I want to give a, a little bit of a summary of how the measurement actually works and make some comments on that. And then I'm going to make some comments on the empirical analysis, in particular, the extent to which some of the identification for the long run uh, results, you know, use some of the within and the cross occupation variation, some use only the within occupation variation. And I think these, the discrepancy between the results is kind of interesting. And then I want to conclude with maybe a, I want to say like an interpretation <coughs> from growth theory to think about whether these results could actually be telling us something substantial about difference in the nature of technological progress. Let me start with the measurement. So, you know, a really nice contribution of this paper is to provide these measures of technological innovation. And so, you know, just to recap a little bit how that works, uh, so they start with a pound, you know, then they turn it into what, um, you know, my co-authors and I, Kososako Lakis and San Lee, when we used a similar methodology, always call it, this is like the KPST textual grinder. You just put this in and you get out this kind of measure of patent quality, right? And as Larry said, this measure of patent quality is kind of the distinction between you know, how likely is it that, this, that these words are used by patents coming after you? That's the impact part. And how likely is it that these, that these words are novel? That's the novelty part. So they measure this thing of patent quality for each patent uh, for the 19th century. And so for each year, they come up with these distributions, right? So in 19, 1883, there's a distribution of patent quality across patents. In 2005, there is one. Uh, and then to account for the fact that these words or these concepts might be different in different decades. I'm going to take out this year fixed effect to standardize this year, you know, year by year distribution. And then they look at that, right? It's the top 10% of patents. So that's what they're going to call their breakthrough patents. And once they have this measure at the patent level, they're going to advocate the sector and occupation level. So the way they bring this to the sector and occupation level is something like this. They kind of measure this, you know, sectoral level technology uh, te technology measure of psi, and uh, you know, which is as uh, as was pointed out, sort of a per capita measure of the number of breakthrough prints. And so this is the first thing where I, coming from sort of a growth theory, was a little bit surprised why we should scale this by the number of population, because in some sense it goes against this idea that knowledge and technologies are non-rival, right? that it doesn't matter how many people you have you can potentially <coughs> use this technology for, we might not want to scale it. And so I think when you look at the uh, theory, I think then it's, it's I, I would like to see a sort of a little more of a discussion in this paper, what that actually does. So when you look at the production function, this is what, what, they, um, what they do at the end of the day, is a CES between knowledge and the number of workers. They're going to interpret this technology exposure metric as a shock to zeta. Right? But here, you can see that knowledge is not rival with respect to the number of people, right? So if the number of patents, say, was growing at the same rate as the population, but the distribution of this quality measure was stationary, you, know, you would think that the number of patents should be actually growing at the number of the population. And so you know, the top 10% should be growing over time. And so I think that would be just nice to maybe point out in the paper a little bit and, and look into the data how important it is. I think quantitatively, it could be pretty important because especially over the long, long time horizon, the population grows a lot. It's by a factor of 13 between, 18, 18, 50, uh, between 1850 and 2020. So one thing which I would have loved to see in the paper, maybe it's like figure one, would be just a, a raw time series of this kind of sector-specific technology measure for these broad sectors. When you think about the structural transformation in the US, this is the employment share, it's agriculture, manufacturing services. You know, now that you have this measure of technological progress, I would love to see just for these three sectors, you know, how does it look like over time? Do we see similar patterns where agriculture is on the decline, services go up, manufacturing is constant? Do we see these patterns in the, in the sectoral data? I think that would be very fascinating because so far I don't think we have ever, ever seen that what this could look like. So then occupation level, I'm not going to talk about the measurements very much because we've seen this in the talk. They use this measure of 
you know, similarity using this uh, language processing tool, they can come up with a very, uh, very similar measure at the occupational level. Um, the one thing which I was wondering about, um, and, and I think that might be nice to discuss this in the paper a little more, you know, how should we conceptually think about like the dic you know, this dictionary of occupational titles in 1991, the words of a particular occupation, with regards to a patent for that occupation in 1880. These occupations are different now, and maybe they're precisely different because we've seen all this innovation happens. Now, there is a paper which I think there's sort of a common thread among at least a quarter of the co-authors, right? Brian, who works with, uh, who works with, with Otter and Solomon, who I think get to this a little more that they try to measure this occupational content for the last 80 years. So one thing which I think would be nice for this paper, if you have the data already via Brian, could you do the same analysis at the occupational level using the Dictionary of Occupational Titles in, say, you know, 1950 or 1960? And just show us kind of how, how different how different these are. I think that would be kind of very interesting to see. Now, for the analysis, so the baseline specification, which most of their analysis hinges on, is essentially a regression of you know occupational uh, growth rates of employment or wages on this. Well, now I'm going to use, try to use that technology too. Uh, here we go. Ooh. And, and there's, uh, you know, innovation measure eta. Right? And so uh, here, uh, you know, that coefficient is, is interpreted in the paper as, as reflecting the, the negative correlation between innovation outcomes or innovation, uh, innovation shocks and the subsequent changes in employment. And I think for that specification, I would, I would like to see or I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit more about how much of the variation are we going to getting this from, like within occupations over time versus across occupations. And, and essentially boils down to, should we put in like this occupation fixed effect or not? I think the main long run results, they're not going to have this occupation fixed effect. And so they're going to get a lot of identification out of you know, secular differences in innovation propensity across different occupations. So one thing which I would like to see, or which I think that the paper would benefit for, really explore you know, what happens over this long run when you put this occupation fixed effect. One thing which I really like about this paper is that this methodology allows us to have a time occupation varying feature in this innovation intensities. And I think for that time period under consideration, this might be really important. So here's kind of the result which came to my mind. Right? Suppose you have machine operators that are on the decline over the 20th century and you have administrative workers that are on the, up, on the uptick. To the extent that there are these you know, systematic differences in innovation across these industries, and I'm going to take a very particular example here, it's constant over time. Right? Without the occupation fixed effect, you're going to find the negative beta, uh, but obviously you know, that would be a very different way how we interpret the data. Now, could this be important? I think quantitatively it can, and I think it goes exactly to the numbers which we've, which we've seen, which we've seen in Larry's talk. So let's look into this a little more detail. So when we look at the occupational employment data for 1850, or also looking at the CPS in 1980 onwards, um, the results which they have are these kind of impulse responses, right? Um, so this is, I think, that this is for, for wage growth, but for, for um, you know, occupational level, occupational level, it, 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 it looks similar. Um, and, uh, and here is the, the results for the individual level regression, which, um, uh, which has the occupation fixed effect. Right? And so these results are, are kind of different quantitatively. They're different quantitatively because, so the beta here in the wage growth regression is 0.3. In the employment regression, I think it was about 0.2, as you mentioned, I think like a 2% per year, right? A 20% cumulative change on the employment side. While when you put the occupational fixed effects, the beta, which we estimate here on the micro data, is about one, minus 1.55, but that's a beta times 100. So you know, if I did the math right from the table, it looks like as if the employment responses from the regressions without the occupation fixed effects are roughly in order of magnitude smaller. And so I think that would be nice to just kind of tease out what this, uh, what this would look like in the paper. I think the same applies, sorry, when we look at the, um, when we look at the sectoral regressions within the manufacturing sector in the beginning. Again, I think the methodology is precisely nice because it has variation across time and across sectors. So thinking about 
what happens at this employment response within the manufacturing industries over time. I think it would be nice. And so I think putting the sector fixed effect would be, um, would be great to do. Now, in the final couple of minutes, I want to talk a little bit more about a potential interpretation from the theory. So, you know, what the paper does, we've seen this, is a very nice exercise of combining this idea of capital skill complementarity with technological shocks and this idea of vintage human capital. So I really kind of enjoyed reading this analysis. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat this here, but I want to give a slightly different perspective, which is a little bit inspired from growth theory and, um, and which, which I would like to see maybe some people sort of follow up on this measurement exercise. So suppose you think about a world where production looks like this, right? There's sort of a, a, a factor neutral TFP term A, and maybe this good is produced by combining kind of different occupations with some elasticity of substitution. And so I want to think of here as like two measures of technological progress. One is like factor neutral productivity, I want to call this solo. And the other one, the N, I want to call this Smith, right? This is kind of the division of labor where we can, you know, sort of maybe produce in, a, in a sort of more occupations. Now, when you think about this from like an aggregate equilibrium model, there's going to be some maybe partial equilibrium demand function for these goods. And when you think about a measure of productivity, like these unit costs, um, obviously A and N, Solo and Smith, they're going to sort of show up in this isomorphic way, right? Because they're going to shift up total factor productivity in these industries. And I think that made it really difficult for growth economists on an empirical side to get a handle on, well, how much of growth is driven by, you know, factor neutral technology, how much of growth is driven by this division of labor. We have a lot of theories on that. But I think if you were to ask me, can we sort of do a growth decomposition to say how much of U.S. growth is due to Smith and how much is due to Solo? I don't know. We have an answer for that. I think potentially your data and your methodology could kind of shed light on this question. And I think here's why. So when you think of aggregate labor demand for this firm or for this industry, uh, you're going to get that aggregate labor demand is this power function of, of total factor productivity, right? And I guess, and again, sort of Solo and Smith, they sort of show up in this isomorphic way. There's really nothing to identify. When you look at the occupational level employment patterns, exactly what you have, so then you think that there's exactly this discrepancy, right? When you look at employment at the occupational level, so now, oops, so now Solo and Smith, they have a life on their own, right? Solo, I guess, kind of shifts out labor demand in exactly sort of this factor neutral way. In particular, employment is increasing in this factor neutral solo type TFP. But then the Smith division of labor part, I think, has exactly these two sort of, you know, concepts of labor replacing technologies that you guys highlight. Right? In particular, labor demand at the occupational level is increasing in solo, and it could be decreasing in this division of labor type technology to the extent that occupations are you know, more substitutable than, um, than the demand elasticity. So why do I think this is important? I think it's important because the, the, the way how you measure innovation in this paper, it focuses on 10% of the patents. And so one thing which I was kind of inspired by to think of from reading your analysis is to say, well, you know, could it be that what you guys are really have a good handle to identify what these 10% breakthrough innovations are sort of identifying in the data is exactly this kind of Smith type of, uh, of technological progress where precisely by those words being novel, by precisely those words being sort of build on as they have this impact, they're exactly about this division of labor, while the remaining 90% of the pattern, they drive most of the variation in this factor neutral kind of solo type TFP, which might account for a lot of aggregate growth, but you know, we wouldn't pick it up in this occupational, occupational level regressions. And so I think, um, I think that's sort of a very exciting thing to think through for you know, growth economists and macroeconomists going forward. Uh, and so that's why I think this methodology and the data will be, will be in high demand. So let me just conclude. I think it's, a, it's really a fantastic paper that um, I enjoyed spending the last couple of, couple of days on. I think this should be read widely. If you haven't 
done it yet and you have a free Sunday ahead of you, this might be good. Uh, and I think it's really potential kind of key, key reference for future work on the nature of technological progress. So this uh, is just me showing this not sort of a, an empty promise as we've seen in the last paper. This is an email which I wrote to, to two of my advisees who kind of work on this type of technological progress in the 1850, 1900s. And I told them, look, take a look at this occupational paper might be useful for you. Um, anyhow, thank you so, so much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper, and thanks for writing it. All right, if the authors want to come down and take some questions. Just make sure all of us, okay, sure. Can I say one thing to Michael? Yes, thanks, for, thanks for your comment. Uh, I just want to clarify one thing. I think I don't think we're ready to say that all technology on average has been displaced to workers. We're a little bit reluctant to say that. Because I think what we're missing out is spillovers to new occupations and new tasks being created. Yeah. So I I, I know a, I totally that's agree. a big part that we're so, missing. So I, I don't think we're like quite there yet. But. No, no, that's uh, so maybe uh, just to be very precise, I think these you know, the last slide of the Solo versus the Smith part, I think, was trying to make exactly this point and to say, well, look, in the aggregate, you know, maybe a lot of these patents, which we don't count as breakthrough, as what you would be measuring, right, have a different feature. No, no. I'm with you, but I'm saying even within those 10%, there might be ones that just create new tasks and new occupations. Right. Yeah, I, that's the, yeah. I agree. As the, as these kind of Smithian ones. So yeah, we're, we're not like technological little guys. Right? Oh, we're, no. we're like, progress is good. You know? <laughs> we're not going to go burn down uh, Google. So uh, why is it that you know the, the graph that Michael showed at the very beginning with the labor share having a clear kink, like 1980? Was it 1980? Um, why why isn't that showing up in, in what you guys are doing? Everything it looked. Like your results just look like they're the same before and after. So he, you know, he's, he's, you said that maybe that's changing your view, but how do you reconcile them exactly? I assume that graph wasn't wrong. So is this a question for me? Well, uh, well, it it's was frequency. Both of you. Like, how do you reconcile those two ch charts? Why wasn't there a kink in your graphs? Uh, which graphs? Uh, so. I mean, the level of progress. If the, changing, if, right? the, if the labor share certainly starts dropping in 1980, shouldn't we have seen an increase in labor displacement? That's what's happens, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. we didn't, he didn't show you the level plots. Yeah. OK. Yeah. It is. What happens is there are these kind of waves uh -huh. that are very low frequency. And one of them is the 80s, which is the ICT. So you do detect that. Uh, but, but that said, I think yeah, the, before that, why didn't the labor share decline before that, with, it's because it was the Smithian kind of... The data starts in 1950, so I think it's hard to say what happened to the labor share before 1950. Yeah, and it could also just be that at the industry level, this is kind of always how it works. You know, as we do capital deepening over time, the labor share will tend to decline, and then what's maybe happened now is the arrival rate of these technologies has increased without enough new things being created to offset them. So we're kind of... We're kind of focusing on the perspective of incumbent workers from this paper. And so, you know, the idea is kind of like, you know, we think trade is a good thing too, but we think that workers who are exposed to, to trade shocks are also experienced concentrated losses. We're kind of picking up that same thing from the perspective of incumbent workers. And I think the concern now with all these labor share type things is that the rate of displacement may be exceeding the rate at which we're creating new tasks, at least at the, sh on the short run. So that's what, what exposes these workers to, to declines. And in the model, actually, for low-skilled workers, which has kind of been the focus of a lot of this automation-type literature, what's interesting is it's purely a GE effect that hits them. And it's much stronger in our model than it is relative to a, in a standard model. Because the idea is, like, in a standard model, um, you, know, you make one factor more productive, and there's some, you know, the marginal products are such that this can lead wages to decline, but it's not by very much. But in our model, the quantity of actual skill that's going into these low-skilled tasks goes up because you have all these formerly high-skilled workers who are displaced. They're now competing with these low-skilled workers in, these, uh, in the same set of tasks. And so the GE effect, like the, the rise in skill premium is larger and the drop in the low-skilled wage is much larger. So the question is, like, if we're not 
creating the new tasks for these low skilled workers fast enough, then that could really hit them hard, not through these kind of second moment type effects, or, or in other words, differences in the cross section for workers who are exposed and not exposed, but rather just through the, the GE aggregate effects. Yeah. Can you discuss the, the across occupation and within occupation uh, results uh, that, you know, you point? So those are, I mean, I guess the, the practical thing is these, you know, the frequency of these things moves is somewhat slow. So we can, I think the within occupation stuff, we can do more it, with a micro level because it's not just, we're using an extra dimension of variation. there. We see the origin of all the, the breakthrough patents. So we can look at basically differences in the timing of when different industries figure things out. And so that gives us a little bit more variation, but it also makes it not immediate how to compare the magnitudes of the coefficients from the long run type regressions with the ones that we do inside the census. So we have a little bit more power to tease out mechanisms inside the census just because we see more. So like I know what industry and what occupation you're working in before the shock hits. And so I can use that variation um, to, to get at the mechanism better. So you're saying the magnitudes that you can't really compare the 30% with the 2%? Is that the... No, what is an average? That was an individual effect. And so the, <coughs> those are all these composition effects that happen when you look at averages, right? I mean, it's possible that the average effect is just driven by people dropping out and no one's wages actually defined. Uh, and just to follow up on what Larry was saying, I think the, the long term regressions, they also have this version we look at within industry, not within occupation. I think it's hard, yeah. I mean, we, one can always add fixed effects, but you know, we're looking at growth rates. So you add a Fixed effects, you're basically comparing to some predetermined linear trend. Uh, we could certainly do that. I mean, just, yeah, which is not sure how informative that is. But uh, I mean, it's a decomposition, so I think we should certainly report that. Uh, I think it's, it's informative. Uh, Just a, so the way your methodology is to pick the ten percent of the distribution uh, every year for which patents are really breakthrough patents. Um, so if there's an acceleration in innovation um, over time, these ten percent do not represent the same thing. So are you dealing with any of that, or it's a constant breakpoint? So it's not ten percent every year. So there's some fixed effects taken out, which reflect the fact that the, like the language itself changes a little bit. But once you've taken out those fixed effects, the idea is there's more patents that show up in the in the right tail some years relative to others. So there actually is you see this big acceleration and okay. these breakthrough technologies during the ICT revolution. So that's why it's like the slope coefficient is this is stable through that period, but the x variable that you're multiplying it by is going up, um, and and. Yeah, so that's kind of, those distinctions I think are important. Yeah. Yeah, I, have, I have two questions. First is, um, have you looked whether some occupations actually it's easier to be retrained or actually to switch jobs, like as the population has been more educated, right? More people finish high school or college. Now people can you know move on to new occupations. It's easier for them. And the second thing is in terms of, you're looking at thing W2, right? What mm -hmm. about, in the higher earners, maybe some of their compensation comes in forms that are actually not income. Um, so how, how, I mean, I guess, how would that affect your results? Let's see. So the W-2 based thing, at least stock option type compensation is going to be in those sorts of measures. And we're excluding folks who are self-employed from the analysis. So if I had the data to, to look at the other things, I would. First, but we're kind of limited, especially if we want to use the whole time series by what we can see in the W two data. So I'm not sure what. But I'd love to do it, but I, I haven't been able to yet. Um, getting a good measure of specificity to think about is actually a little bit more challenging than you might might think. It's it's not. So we've done a bunch of subsample splits on various occupation characteristics, for example, and what you see is it shows up in most of them. The one place where it doesn't is in these very interpersonal type of <laughs> tasks. That's really the one category. But it's not just routine. It shows up in kind of non-routine tasks as well. So I, you know, our hope is in putting this series on the table, it's very disaggregated. And so in principle, there's lots of different ways to cut this. Um, but yeah, if I had, 
the, the, the other challenge is I only get occupation at one point in time. So it would be kind of nice to know, ideally, whether you know people who've been bouncing around between lots of different occupations, presumably their exposure is lower, but I can't get occupational tenure. Um, yes. I, I have a question a little bit related. So you find the results uh, for the when you look at heterogeneity in the older uh, population. Uh, so maybe this also relates to the idea that maybe for them retraining and going into the business is not uh, straightforward, so they just get out. And the other thing is you also find in high-skilled labor, that may, again, this may come to the education, maybe the level of education if the high-skilled uh, labor is a lot higher and then maybe they are just maybe spilling over to other things which you are not able to observe. Can I take that? Sure. Uh, the first part, you're entirely right. I think that's our interpretation of the facts. Um, now, on the part of the education, what's kind of remarkable, at least to us, is that look at individual workers, and then it's again, it's the same occupation industry cell. There's basically very little difference in outcomes uh, as a function of whether of, of their education. Oh, okay. So maybe college is not what it used to be. Uh, but what we're seeing is also there's increased exposure uh, to technology of occupations that emphasize, that require knowledge. So here's a, like a, a brief way to kind of summarize the trends, I think in my view, is that for up until the 80s, or say 70s, much of uh, the, the occupations that were most exposed to technology were kind of blue collar workers. And what you're seeing is since the 70s, uh, you're seeing a shift in the exposure of office workers. And that's basically due to the rise of uh, essentially software and AI. So, you know, it's not that the robots are displacing the factory workers right now, but it's uh, the software is displacing the, uh, the office workers. Or okay. displacing or... Uh, all right, sorry. Uh, let's take a break. Let's take this discussion out to coffee. It's across the way in the bike area. Oh,